Welcome to this very first video made for this brand new channel, Scruffy Tales. Since I'm new at this, don't expect too much from my videos to begin with. My channel will have humble beginnings until I get the hang of this, but hopefully with some interesting content in the end. I'm doing this because I think it's fun and I enjoy creating stuff. So, that out of the way. Today we're going to take a closer look at the Swedish made infantry fighting vehicle known as the CV-90 and the reason is the announcement made by Sweden to send 51 CV-90s to Ukraine to help in the war against the Russian invaders. With that announcement we have seen several videos pop up on YouTube, often with a robot voice, often stating only boring facts about speed, troop capacity and so forth. Uh, so I figured I would try and do my own video on the CV-90 and explore what it might actually bring to the battlefields of Ukraine. We will look at its armament, the history behind the vehicle and the doctrine it was specifically designed to operate within and the overall capabilities of the CV-90. And we will also take a look at how it compares to some other IFVs. Sweden will send the version of CV-90 known as STRF-9040C, a vehicle with upgraded armor and increased protection from anti-tank weapons, mines and improvised explosive devices, among other things. It is the version Sweden has used in international operations in places like Liberia and Afghanistan. There are several versions of CV-90 in use all across Europe and each nation and army has a CV-90 suited to its own specific needs with various systems, armor packages and armament, even different sizes. What truly sets the Swedish CV-90 apart from all the other variants is its main gun, the powerful Bufors L-70 automatic cannon, originally an anti-aircraft gun and capable of firing 5 40mm rounds per second. The gun can use situation-specific ammunition to deal with various targets such as high explosives against infantry, sabot rounds versus armor targets including main battle tanks with flanking and rear hits and proximity rounds to deal with helicopters. The Swedish CV-90 is more or less capable of engaging every target that comes across, save for perhaps fighter jets. One option the Swedish CV-90 has is an ammunition type known as 3P. If these will be supplied to Ukraine remains to be seen, but we can cover it briefly just to get an idea of what a Swedish STRF-9040 brings to the table, potentially. The 3P ammunition used by the 40mm IFV autocannon and the 57mm autocannons on Swedish naval vessels is a smart munition program with six modes of attack to engage missiles, aircraft, and sea-going and ground targets. The 3P is short for pre-fragmented programmable proximity fuse and is designed to allow the gunner to quickly be able to engage a target without having to swap between different types of ammunition. It allows the gunner to use the same ammunition against multiple targets. The CV-90 could in theory only have 3P in its magazines, engage an enemy BMP with anti-armor mode, switch to high explosive and air burst to deal with the troops climbing out of the wreck and hiding behind it, and then turn to engage with proximity mode, the enemy helicopter swooping in to support the BMP and dismounts. The 40mm Bufors is one of the world, modern world's most effective and successful weapon systems. Starting out as an anti-aircraft gun in the 1930s, it became one of the most common anti-aircraft guns in use by both sides during the entire length of World War II. And after World War II, it has served in every war and conflict imaginable on every continent ever since. It is reliable, it is a true workhorse and proven in combat to be an extremely effective gun. And part of the reason is the size of its ammunition, providing all the kinetic energy an IFV needs to destroy a modern armored target. The Swedish CV-90 with its 40mm autocannon has around 200 rounds of ammunition in its hull 
and with an additional 24 rounds in the turret that are divided between three magazines of eight rounds each. The low magazine capacity is a potential drawback of the 9040, as is the fact that the magazines needs to be manually reloaded by hand by the vehicle commander. That said, you have the option of having up to three different types of ammunition ready to be used at a moment's notice, allowing the gunner to quickly switch between ammunition types depending on the situation at hand. All in all, it is clear that the 40mm Bullfosch is a gun that demands respect, capable of destroying any type of vehicle that is in a tank from any angle, and tanks can be engaged in the flank and rear with a good chance of scoring a penetrating hit. But as impressive as the CV-90's main gun is, that was not the only feature taken into consideration as the vehicle was being designed in the mid-80s. It was designed to fill a specific role in the Swedish Armed Forces, tailored specifically to suit the doctrine of the Swedish Armored Regiments. And to understand what that role and doctrine was and is, we have to take a look at history. The American Bradley and Soviet BMP are perhaps the two most famous IFVs in the world, but the fact is they were far from the first troop carriers designed to stay and support the infantry in combat. In the 50s, West Germany designed the Schützenpanzer Lang HS-30, a troop carrier with a 20mm autocannon specifically created to fight right next to tanks, together with the infantry it carried with it. A doctrine that was very different from the US Armored Forces, who relied on APCs like the M113 to taxi troops around the battlefield, but were never really meant to stay and fight together with the infantry dropped off. The Schützenpanzer was designed based on the experiences and tactics Germany had gathered and battle proven during World War II with their Panzer Grenadiers. The Panzer Grenadiers were often transported in open half tracks, the SDK FZ 251, as they followed the German tanks in combat, and they fought very often mounted rather than dismounted. This proved to be a successful tactic that allowed the infantry to not only be protected, but they also remained as mobile and maneuverable as their transports and the tanks. This allowed for aggressive maneuvering with tanks, transports and infantry to overwhelm the enemy with a combination of speed and firepower. There are even examples of Russian infantry from World War II as they were riding on their tanks into German lines, firing submachine guns at the Germans as they forced their way through the German positions. The effectiveness of these tactics did not go unnoticed in Sweden and were soon adopted by the Swedish armored units. Sweden started out with the so-called KP car, taken into service in 1942 as its armored troop carrier during World War II. It was not the most optimal choice of vehicle, but it was open top to allow the infantry to fight mounted, and it often had in its turret twin link machine guns that could unleash terrifying salvos on an enemy position. This was, for all intents and purposes, a bulletproof bus, and it was lovingly called the Coffin by Swedish troops. The KP car was eventually deployed on UN missions after World War II and during the Congo crisis of the early 60s saw combat on several occasions. Later versions would be fully enclosed after the open top variant proved to be a liability in urban combat, and the turret was replaced with two sets of machine guns operated by the infantry. It would serve Sweden as a trusted APC all the way to 2004, believe it or not. The shortcomings of the KP car eventually led to the development of a new troop transport in the 50s as Sweden saw the need for a more potent vehicle. Sweden went on to modify its fleet of M41 light tanks, turning them all into the early APC variant known as PBV-301, taken into service in 1962, four years after the Schützenpanzer and five years ahead of the Soviet BMP-1. The 301 was a small tracked vehicle that allowed its troops to fight mounted from hatches, just as the German Schützenpanzer. Having removed the turret of the tank, it was now armed with a 20mm autocannon that was reused from fighting jets and could transport seven soldiers and had a crew of three. 
both the Schützenpanzer and the 301 took the concept of the Panzer Grenadiers to the next level with a powerful odd cannon that allowed both vehicles to engage all targets short of tanks. By being fully tracked, they could follow the tanks all across the battlefield. The hatches offered full protection from incoming fire when they were closed, and when opened allowed the infantry to actively support the vehicle without the need to dismount to be effective. Now, both these vehicles rely on hatches to allow the infantry to fight from the vehicle. But what about gun ports? Well, they didn't have them. You might have seen some videos that point out that the CB90 does not have gun ports, which would be a downside. That does depend on the situation, which shouldn't come as a surprise. If fighting in an NBC environment, if nuclear, biological, or chemical warheads have been used, then gun ports are indeed required to allow the infantry to fight safely from the vehicle, but not without issues. Gun ports and periscopes offer little chance of, of actually spotting and hitting an enemy. Your field of fire and line of sight is limited. All your gunfire takes place inside of the vehicle, requiring additional venting systems to remove all the dangerous gases and smoke. And, perhaps more importantly, each gun port is literally a hole straight through your side armor, a weak point where the vehicle has little to no protection from incoming heavier rounds. Therefore, it is no surprise that gun ports have been abandoned as a concept for decades. For instance, the first versions of the Bradley did come with gun ports, but they have since been discarded for additional armor. So, while hatches are indeed riskier in terms of overall protection for the infantry when they are open, they do provide better armor to flanking hits, and the infantry can fight freely and can look around freely for enemies. And if you are in an MBC environment, you simply have to keep your hatches closed to keep the vehicle sealed and safe. The Soviet BMP-1 was designed with both gun ports and hatches, and taken into service in 1967. But the hatches were more used as exit points than to shoot from. It was a troop transport designed to not only fight, but to fight in extremely hostile environments where nuclear and chemical weapons had been used. But more notably, it carried a good gun and came with an anti-tank missile. And the missile is what set the BMP-1 apart from previous troop carriers, to my mind. This was a troop transport that could destroy a main battle tank. And to me, this is what makes this the first true infantry fighting vehicle. A vehicle following tanks into combat bring in infantry to support both the transport and the tanks that can be a threat to all armor and with the ability to support the tanks in the armored combat. As it happens, we are actually seeing BMP-1s being used in combat in Ukraine even today. So while the Schützenpanzer and PVV-301 were indeed intended to follow tanks into combat and to support the infantry with powerful autocannons, they weren't any real threat to enemy tanks. The BMP-1 was a real threat to Western tanks. West Germany adopted the idea of an anti-tank missile for its next troop transport, the Martyr 1, almost 10 years later. Initially, the Martyr 1 also included gun ports, but like with the Bradley, they were later removed. Funnily enough, these old vehicles, taken into service in 1971, will be deployed to Ukraine shortly as well. And of course, in 1981, the Bradley entered into service, it too with anti-tank missiles. And as we all know, the Bradley is another vehicle we will see in Ukraine. In 1987, the UK introduced the Warrior family of vehicles, officially classified as an IFV, but it isn't a real threat to tanks with its 30mm autocannon, an autocannon relying on two magazines of only three rounds each. Now, this vehicle is intended to support infantry in an ongoing firefight with only six available rounds at most at any one time is a bit of a mystery to me. And to me it screams heavy APC rather than being a proper IFV. If you thought the CV-90 was in trouble with 24 rounds ready at any one time, imagine only having six in the Warrior. 
that said some warriors were upgraded with Mylan ATGMs during the Gulf War, giving the vehicles much needed anti-tank capability. Sweden did not, however, add a missile to its next uh, troop carrier. The PBV-302 was taken to service in 1966, a year before the BMP-1 was revealed in 1967. The 302 was in part based on the American M113, but domestically designed and built. Features of the M113 that suited Swedish requirements were kept, but most notably armor and off-road capability needed a Swedish touch and redesign. It was outfitted with the same 20mm autocannon used by the PBV-301, had a crew of three and could transport up to eight soldiers. It was designed to keep up with the newly adopted tank, the famous STRV-103, had excellent mobility in rough terrain and good protection from incoming fire and artillery, and naturally had hatches that allowed the troops to fight mounted if needed. It was designed to specifically be used in tandem with the tanks and the STRV-103 in particular, to be used in accordance with a specific doctrine. And we will return to take a look at this doctrine in a little while. Like I said, the APC version was never outfitted with anti-tank missiles, but other vehicles were made into dedicated tank hunters equipped with ATGMs. This meant that Sweden for a long time never had a true IFV and instead relied on a powerful APC, the PBV-302, for attacking and assaulting enemy positions. The 302 never was a true threat to tanks. Instead, its focus was on getting soldiers into point-blank range of the enemy and to allow troops to fight mounted. Eventually, trials were made to mount the capable Swedish-made ATGM system RB-56 on the 302, but the concept was never adopted. So why are hatches so important? Well, any vehicle is vulnerable on the flanks and rear. Armor is thinner and no one is looking in those directions as a rule. The best way to defeat a vehicle is to outflank it. If you have soldiers looking around, they can spot enemies on the move and can warn the crew of the danger, and possibly even initiate combat to prevent an anti-tank weapon from being fired. The vehicle is obviously much safer as a consequence, especially in this day and age when an enemy could be equipped with something like the N-Law that can guarantee a kill from only 20 meters away. As lookouts, the soldiers can look up at a ridge line or a hill or down a slope or into ditches and trenches, something that is hard to do with periscopes, for instance, especially the closer these terrain features are to the vehicle. And also, the soldiers can help the driver by guiding him while going in reverse, helping him avoiding obstacles and allowing the commander to focus on more important tasks. The other option the troops have to protect the vehicle is to dismount and step outside and spread out. This is a fully reasonable way of doing things and a proven tactic, so don't get me wrong. But if a need arises that requires quick redeployment, then the vehicle has to wait for every soldier to receive the orders to move, wait for a squad to run back and climb back inside before being able to get moving. You are slowed down, you are slow to react, and it could potentially get you killed. Clearly. Having hatches allows for options that makes the vehicle fast to respond to changes on the battlefield. What about if the vehicle is moving? Without hatches, the infantry inside provides nothing to the vehicle. Even with periscopes, they provide very little when the vehicle is on the move. You could argue perhaps that if they are provided with cameras, it would change things, and you would be right, I suppose. It would change things for sure. But if we look at the Bradley, the dismounts can basically only borrow the scopes used by the crew, and only one at a time, and usually only to orientate themselves before stepping outside. And the South Korean K-21 IFV has a single camera for the dismounts, that clearly cannot provide any reasonable observation to all of its flanks.
This is why even the most modern IFBs, like the Puma, has the option for troops to stick their heads outside of the vehicle to act as lookouts. With hatches, the soldiers can keep an eye on the flanks as the vehicle advances, and if enemies are spotted, again, they can warn the crew and even engage the enemy if possible. Once again, the vehicle becomes safer and more protected. So, what about the attack? What can hatches provide during an assault? Or if the lookout spot an enemy and the transport goes on the offense, what can be done from the hatches? Well, for starters, the same rules apply to the attack as for using the troops as lookouts. Vehicles are vulnerable on the flanks, and mounted infantry can provide protection and security as the vehicle advances upon an enemy held position. It also doesn't automatically slow things down to a walk or reduce the vehicle to a support platform. Now, don't get me wrong, dismounting your troops is a good option when done in the right situation, and is absolutely essential. But what if it isn't the right situation? Being only able to fight dismounted slows down combat and reduces the effectiveness of the vehicle, but also the effectiveness of the infantry. You lose tactical flexibility without the option of relying on both dismounted and mounted combat. Fighting from the hatches provides excellent protection from enemy rifles and machine guns, even protection from shrapnel and explosions. And you do not expose yourself to incoming fire by having to move from cover to cover as you advance. Your cover, superior cover at that compared to trees and brick walls, advances with you, always keeping you safe. Obviously, firing your weapon as the vehicle is moving at speed reduces accuracy by quite a lot. While on the move, you are mainly looking to suppress the enemy, unless you're going really slow. All in all, suppressing or shooting to kill either way you make it difficult for an enemy equipped with an anti-tank weapon, or any weapon for that matter, to take his shot. Usually when talking about mounted combat and hatches with random people online, you know the type, and I'm probably one of them, people like to point out that it somehow is ludicrous, that it doesn't work, and that it only means the soldiers will die inside the vehicle instead of outside. I remember this one guy in particular over at the uh, Shediversity Discord of all places who called me a layman as I described Western doctrine surrounding armored assaults. To this day I still think it's one of the best replies I've received while discussing this topic. And to be honest it's not entirely untrue I guess. Anyway, Consider that if you don't have hatches, then the soldiers can potentially spot a flanking enemy. They can potentially engage and suppress a flanking enemy with an anti-tank weapon. It means the enemy will almost always be able to take that flanking shot, which means you end up with dead soldiers and a dead crew. Some might say you are better off with advanced cameras which isn't a feature in most troop transports, and if they have them, it's usually one camera used to orientate the soldiers of where to link up once they dismount. Periscopes do provide some ability to keep a lookout from within the vehicle, but how then can you return fire? Your gunner might be busy shooting at a building or armored vehicle and can't just swing his gun around to kill the guy with the M-Law that popped up 25 meters behind you. Others might say there will always be another vehicle around to protect you, or a drone overhead to keep an eye on things. Completely unrealistic is my reply. There will always be a vehicle on the far flank of your unit, and there will always be cover that can and will block a drone's line of sight. Without hatches, in my layman opinion, you lose important tactical flexibility and security. You might say the whole point of the dismounts is to leave the vehicle and keep it safe, as the name itself suggests, and you would be absolutely correct. But the vehicle protects you from heavy machine guns, compared to trees that can't stop a normal 556 bullet. So you have superior protection, compared to running around outside of the vehicle. You have access to an ungodly amount of ammunition that you don't have to carry around yourself. You don't have to carry around your big heavy machine gun. 
and if you need to withdraw or advance, the vehicle simply does what it has to do. And if you get wounded, no one has to carry you back. As pointed out before, you slow everything down if you constantly have to wait for the dismounts to run back and climb back inside. You have the choice, depending on the situation, to either dismount or stay mounted and still be in the fight is clearly the much better option. And let's not forget that it is common practice in all armies that crews of armored vehicles, be it tanks or APCs or IFVs, stick their heads out of the hatch to get a better view of their surroundings to better and safely maneuver the vehicle. Looking outside keeps vehicles safer. So, let us take a look at Swedish armored doctrine from the Cold War and the tactics on how to use the mechanized infantry in an attack. More specifically, the armored infantry, in Swedish known as Panzerskytte, and how they together with the PBV-302 would form the heavy shock troops of the Swedish army. As shock troops, armored infantry relied on two main ways to attack a position in force. The first choice was the standard dismounted attack with the 302 in support, pushing into the enemy position on foot and driving him from the battlefield. Having tanks in close support right next to the infantry during such a push was a common option to increase the firepower of the assault. The idea being that you aimed so much firepower downrange at the enemy that they would not dare come out of cover to shoot back, allowing the armored infantry to get into point-blank range clear out foxholes, trenches, and other enemy positions with grenades, bayonets, and full auto bursts. Having a couple of squads still mounted and ready in the hatches provided support and the ability to quickly respond to an unforeseen situation. The second choice was to storm the enemy positions with the infantry mounted, fighting from the hatches. The 302s would drive up to, even into, the enemy positions with the infantry firing from the hatches. Some troops would dismount to clear out foxholes and trenches, while others remained in their vehicles to stay mobile to counter any changes on the battlefield, or to continue the advance. Again, tanks would often be used right next to the 302s to significantly increase the firepower of the assault. This type of attack also had the advantage that your troops could quickly, while being protected, cross dangerous areas where the enemy more than likely would try and stop you with mortars and machine guns. So, you reduce the time you would be exposed to incoming fire while also enjoying the protection of the vehicle's armor while at the same time being able to fire back at the enemy. The key to success was the combination of speed and firepower. It's no wonder that the official motto of the Swedish Armed Forces is Slå hårt, slå snabbt, strike hard, strike fast. And we must not forget that this was intended to be used in combined arms situation, with artillery and mortars hitting the enemy positions before the armor pushes in and even close air support sweeping in to drop bombs and napalm on the enemy as the armored infantry approached the objective. As you can tell, the Swedish doctrine of mounted combat, copied from the playbook of the German Panzergrenadiers of World War II, allows for aggressive maneuvering, rapid assaults, and massive concentration of firepower. Indeed, in Norway, armored infantry are known as stormtroopers, and for good reason. Through a combination of aggression and maneuverability, you control the initiative and maintain the momentum. And Sweden's ability to fight mounted has obvious advantages that offers versatility that a vehicle without hatches cannot compete with. I think it is quite obvious that if you do not have the doctrine or even the option, you lose tactical flexibility and momentum. 
and that aggressiveness and flexibility is what Sweden took to heart in designing the PBB301 and PBB302, designs that would eventually all culminate in the development of the Stridsfogoniti, the CV90. Stridsfogoniti, literally translated as Combat Vehicle 90, came into being as Sweden felt it needed a new troop transport. Not just another APC, but a proper IFB. Both the German Martyr 1 and the American Bradley were considered and tested, but they didn't live up to it. The Swedish army was looking for in terms of mobility and firepower. A completely new domestic vehicle had to be designed. Excellent mobility, capable armor, and a gun the crew could depend upon became cornerstones during the development process. Considering how powerful the 40mm Bufors gun would turn out to be when mounted on an IFB, it is interesting to note that a 57mm automatic cannon was considered at one point. Developed in the 80s and taken into service in 1994, the Stridsfordon 9040, Combat Vehicle 9040, within a few short years ended up becoming the world's most capable infantry fighting vehicle. While its armor is good, it is what can be expected from an IFV. Solid protection up front from most auto cannons in use, up to 30mm, protection from heavy machine guns on the flanks and rear, and the CB90 can even soak heat munitions if the angle is right. All in all, pretty standard for a modern IFV. But mobility is where the CV90 excels, and it can cross difficult terrain like a few other armored vehicles, designed to operate in the Swedish Arctic region with deep snow during winter and wet marshes during the summer. If compared to the Bradley, the American IFV doesn't stand a chance in this category as Norway proved when having the Bradley and CV-90 on trial, as well as the Warrior. It should come as no surprise that Norway adopted the CV-90 and rejected the Bradley, as well as the Warrior. Another category where the Swedish CV-90 was for a long time unmatched, of course, concerns its main armament. Like we have already pointed out, the 40mm Bufors automatic cannon is truly a beast of a gun, that fires 5 rounds per second and is capable of punching through the front armor of anything that is in a tank. And even against tanks, a flanking hit can still penetrate. No wonder then that when South Korea designed their brand new IFV, the K21, they provided it with a 40mm automatic cannon as well as programmable ammunition. And when the UK tried to upgrade their outdated fleet of warrior armored vehicles, they plan to equip them with a state-of-the-art 40mm gun, a project that sadly ended in failure and cancellation. Swedish troop transports had for the longest time lacked proper anti-tank capability, but with the STRF-9040 this was rectified with this monster of an autocannon, and with around 230 rounds of ammo in the vehicle, a CV-90 can stay in the fight for the duration. With the CV-940, the concept of the Panzer Grenadiers from World War II had reached new heights in performance and aggression. Like the PBV-301 and PBV-302 before it, the CV-940 was designed around the concept of mounted combat. For all the previously mentioned reasons and advantages, expected to fit a specific role in Swedish doctrine for armored warfare to advance up to and at times into enemy held positions, and doing so equipped with a gun that is well and truly capable of engaging anything on the battlefield short of fighter jets. The 40mm Bufosh also provides a few advantages over anti-tank missiles when engaging heavy armor. If you rely on a wire-guided missile to defeat tanks, like the Bradley does, obstacles become a problem. Same thing with a laser riding missile that BMP 3s relies on. The missiles re require long, clear lines of sight to be effective. So, if you are in a forest or an urban setting surrounded by trees or ruined buildings, your missile is basically useless. You have lost your ability to effectively combat heavy armor, be it an IFV facing you with its front, 
or your average tank. Being able to move around and fire quickly and accurately and repeatedly on target is a far superior quality, especially when you are able to punch through any armor you come across. The tactical limitations of anti-tank guided missiles was partly the reason why Sweden didn't provide them for the CV-90 and instead put them on dedicated tank hunters, because it is hard to be aggressive and offensive with these weapons. But they work wonderful when set up in an ambush or an overwatch position. But these are not weapons used when you need to make a quick decision and get fire on the enemy and maneuver. After all, if we look at the anti-tank missile as a gun, it has one or two rounds ready to fire, it takes ages to reload, you must be stationary in order to fire, and in order to hit, you must remain stationary and exposed to incoming fire for several seconds. You can't fire and then immediately back down into cover. Plus, you can't use the weapon if you are in the middle of a forest, for instance, surrounded by trees. Now, if I described a gun, everyone would laugh. Again, I want to point out that ATGMs are powerful tools when used correctly, but with the CV-90, Sweden felt a powerful autocannon was the better choice for engaging enemy armored vehicles in woodlands, considering that Sweden was and still is about 70% covered in forest. It, of course, did not stop with the STRF-9040. The basic concept of the CV-90 would go on to be proven to be a reliable design that could be modified to suit very specific needs and requirements. Simply by switching out the turret and redesigning the troop compartment, a CV-90 can do whatever you want it to do. It is currently in service in seven armies across Europe, with two more waiting for deliveries, each version tailored to suit each country's needs and requirements. And as I'm writing this, I have seen reports that Italy might become the 10th nation to field the CV-90. And with Ukraine, we would be up to 11. The CV-90 is fast becoming Europe's number one choice for its mechanized and armored forces. Some CV-90s have a 30mm gun, others a 35mm gun. The Czech Republic has put in an order for a completely unique chassis, for instance. This vehicle can be made into whatever you want it or need it to be. Sweden relies on a number of variants, for instance, the LVKV-90 with its radar is designed to be an SPAAG, a self-propelled anti-aircraft gun. The GRK PBV-90 is a mortar carrier with two 120mm mortars per vehicle capable of keeping up with the IV version and always ready to provide indirect fire to support the troops. You have a command version, a vehicle recovery version, a repair version, and not every CV-90 variant in use across Europe has hatches for that matter. Sweden did try a prototype CV-9040 armed with two RB-56B missiles, but nothing came out of it. Interestingly though, the RB-56B missile was more or less a wire-guided, long-range N-law. With the N-law, they just removed the wire from the RB-56. A very simplified explanation, but I digress, moving on. Beyond that, there are several versions available not yet in service, such as the pure APC version without the turret. There's even a light tank version with a 120mm main gun. Poland had a prototype for an advanced high-tech light tank, for instance. There's also a CV-90 variant available these days for interested militaries equipped with either Spike or Akron HGGMs. The Akron is interesting, since it will most likely become Sweden's next ATGM system in a couple of years, so that it is now only recently made available to the CV-90 platform makes you wonder if Sweden will have CV-90s with ATGMs in the near future. The Akron, considered by many as the most advanced ATGM currently available, has also been provided to Ukraine, so it will be properly tested in wartime conditions. So how might Ukraine use the CV-9040? I'm guessing that as they get trained on using them, they might also be introduced to Western tactics and Swedish tactics and doctrine. 
The CV-9040 was, after all, designed to be a specific cog in the Swedish army. A common choice for Swedish commanders is to team, team up two platoons of CV-90s with one platoon of tanks, or two single CV-90s with a single tank, and vice versa. This is a very Western approach, and it gives the CV-90 some heavy-hitting firepower and support. A proper assault is also committed with mortars. These days, Sweden relies on the GRK PBV-90 to provide mortar support. The CV-90 with twin-link 120mm mortars in its turret that we mentioned earlier. If four such mortar carriers, three tanks and six CV-9040s all aim their firepower at the same enemy-held location, that's a lot of high explosives detonating around the heads of the enemy, which allows for the CV-90s to advance up to and into the enemy position. Here, just as with the older PBV-302s, you now have the option of fighting mounted or dismounted. Just imagine getting shelled by eight 120mm mortars, three tanks and six 40mm autocannons. And then as the explosions stop, you hear engines rumbling and six CV-90s come charging at you only seconds after the echoes of the explosions fade. And angry soldiers with machine guns start firing as the vehicles roll straight up to your positions and then they dismount and assault your trenches. Seems like tactics that Ukrainians would favor. And talking about CV-90s dismounting its infantry for engaging the enemy at point-blank range, we might as well move on to the Swedish dismounts and how they are set up, because it's not unlikely, I feel, that Ukraine might pick up on these ideas as well, while being trained on the CV-90 itself. The Swedish dismount squad of the CV-90 is a six-man team. That means 18 guys in total for the platoon. So, the dismounts are from the moment they step outside of their vehicle at a numerical disadvantage. The solution, according to Swedish doctrine, is adding more firepower. When I did my conscription as a CV-90 dismount squad leader, the squad brought with them two AK-5B marksman rifles and two AT-4s, carried by the squad leader and fire team leader. Then we had two F and Mag medium machine guns, known as KSP-58 in Sweden and M240 in the United States. No designated loaders, the gunners carried all their ammo and forced the rest of us to carry even more. And lastly, we had the two riflemen of the Carl Gustav troop, GRG in Swedish, Moss in the US, Charlie G in some places, but perhaps, perhaps the best name is the Norwegian one. RFK, recoil free cannon, an 84mm reloadable launcher capable of firing a full host of various rounds, including anti armor, smoke, flares, high explosive, and even air bursts, to name but a few. A very versatile and powerful weapon that has had great success in Ukraine against Russian invaders. That means 18 soldiers on foot with three 40mm autocannons, nine machine guns when we include the machine guns on the CV-90, six marksman rifles, six AT-4s and three Carl Gustav recoil rifles. That is a lot of firepower for very few soldiers and you understand why armored infantry was and still is used as heavy shock troops. Moving on to more recent years, I know that the AK-5B marksman rifle has been replaced by an AK-5C equipped with an underslung M203 grenade launcher, swapping some extra aim for extra firepower. The two FN mags have been replaced with SAWS, KSB-90 in Sweden, which allows for more ammunition per carat kilogram and a lighter and easier to handle weapon, swapping firepower for more ammunition and mobility. However, 
one FN mag is still kept in the vehicle for added firepower when required. The Carl Gustav launcher is still in the toolbox with a crew of two. Compared to when I did conscription, a bit over 20 years ago, the modern Dismount squad has several options depending on the situation. For instance, the leaders of the squad don't usually carry AT4s now that they carry 40mm grenades for their launchers, but it is still an option if or when needed. The two soldiers of the Carl Gustav crew might carry AT4s instead of the Gustav if it is the smarter choice. You also have the option to bring the FN mag, as pointed out earlier. Another option is to bring an AK-4D marksman rifle. And lastly, and perhaps most importantly, the squad can bring with them RB-57s, internationally known as NLAW, one of the most capable tank-killing weapons in Ukraine. The NLAW provides the squad with incredible tank-killing capability, even without the 40mm Bufosh on the CV-90, capable of punching through a tank's armor from above, all but guaranteeing a kill. No small feat for an ordinary soldier to possess when going up against tanks that have reigned supreme on the battlefield for a century. The Swedish doctrine also includes a platoon commander on foot of sorts in charge of the troops once dismounted. This role is called Nærstridsledare, the close combat leader. This allows the infantry and vehicles to operate independently away from each other and the platoon commander can focus on the vehicles while the close combat leader takes, takes charge of the dismount. The concept of the armored infantry has remained the same from the 60s to my service to this day. Overwhelming firepower, aggression and charging the enemy into point-blank range with heavily armed infantry fighting closely together with armored vehicles and tanks supported by mortars striking enemy positions up until the armored infantry and the transports crash into the enemy lines. And this is what the CV-9040 was designed for. It was tailor-made for this doctrine and this sort of combat, these sort of maneuvers. Firepower, aggression and mobility. You could say that the armored infantry are the knights of the modern age. Fully armored warriors charging the enemy while mounted on armored steeds closing in to point-blank range for a decisive, hard-hitting blow. And I think this will suit Ukraine very well, this concept and doctrine. We will see if they adopt it in full or partially, or at all for that matter. A small perk with the CV-90 that I haven't touched on yet, that I think will be appreciated by Ukraine, is the fact that the CV-90 can hold a number of anti-tank mines. This means you can rely on your CV-90s and their dismounts to dig in quite heavily if you order them to, or to slow down an enemy if you are forced to fall back. Obviously, you can put mines into any vehicle, but the CV-90 comes with built-in storage for them, so the mines won't steal space from anything else. So, how many versions of the CV-90 will we see in Ukraine? Well, so far that's unknown. Of the fifth one promised, we can assume a large core will be the IFV version. But the 51 vehicles might also include command vehicles and recovery vehicles. Sweden operates a CV-90 version that carries frontline mechanics instead of actual dismounts, for instance. That might even include the mortar carrier mentioned earlier, although I feel this is not very likely. And then there's the anti-aircraft version, the LVKV-90, equipped with a radar to protect an armored battalion from aerial threats. And the interesting part is that, as far as I understand it, most of these exist as C versions. And it is the C versions that have been promised to be delivered to Ukraine. So, my guess is that we will see a full mechanized battalion of various CV-90 vehicles, all with the C upgrades, including IFVs, anti-air, command, forward observers, and recovery vehicles. So how does the CV-90 compare to other vehicles in Ukraine? We've touched on it slightly already here and there, but let's look a bit closer. And let's start off straight away with the big boy in the room, the American M2 Bradley. The Bradley has, as I see it, only one real advantage, the tow launchers. While its 25mm gun demands respect with its depleted uranium rounds, it is unknown if Ukraine will receive these, or if Ukraine even wants them, 
considering the horrendous side effects as this ammunition is radioactive and toxic by nature and could potentially harm the Ukrainian civilian population and the environment in Ukraine for years to come, as we've already seen happen in Iraq after two U.S. invasions. It is potent ammunition, but with drastic drawbacks. The 25mm gun of the Bradley is as such not comparable to the 40mm of the CV-90, because without the depleted uranium it does not hold up, and with the depleted uranium you risk harming the civilian population for generations to come. We've mentioned mobility as well, and we know from the Norwegian trials that the Bradley can't compete with the CV-90 in traversing rough terrain, plowing through snow, or cutting across marshes. And as pointed out, Sweden tested Bradley initially and decided to design the CV-90 because the Bradley didn't live up to the needs and requirements of the Swedish army. Armor and protection should be similar between the two. Both vehicles are protected against heavy machine guns all around, auto cannons up front, and have been upgraded to better withstand RPGs, mines, and improvised explosives. So let's look at the one thing where the Bradley truly has the advantage. The tow launchers, ATGMs, anti-tank guided missiles, are without a doubt effective tank killers when used properly. That the Bradley has tow launchers is, to my mind, truly its saving grace. Anti-tank guided missiles are a nightmare for armored crews. I have experienced it only in training, mind you, and talking to other service members from around the world online, they say the same. It is slightly demoralizing, to say the least being on an exercise and suddenly being told you've been knocked out by a missile. If you receive updates that Op4 has tanks in the area, you can move up reinforcements, you can maneuver, redeploy, etc. to counter the threat. But ATGM teams, they hide on a hill 2-3 kilometers away, waiting for a target to come down a road or crossing a field, and like snipers, they wait patiently and then take the shot. We have seen how effective ATGMs can be in both Iraq and in Syria, not to mention Ukraine. These are very capable weapons when used properly, and the CV-90 doesn't have them. A disadvantage of the CV-90, in my opinion, lacking the hard-hitting capability at long range versus tanks. If the tow missiles are the Bradley's biggest advantage, then the lack of proper hatches is one of its greatest disadvantages. Lack of proper hatches means the infantry is only useful when dismounted. The one hatch the Bradley does have is used exclusively to reload the tow launchers, and never really used by the infantry during transport or combat. The few periscopes they have doesn't help much in providing security. The dismount squad leader can borrow the optics from one of the crew, but this too isn't enough to provide security and is mostly used so the dismounts can get a view of their surroundings before stepping outside. The only way that the Bradley can truly make use of its dismounts is if everything is reduced to walking speed. The dismounts could in theory fight from the top hatch, but without the doctrine to do so it seems like a moot point. Although Ukraine might still use the top hatch despite its design not really being suited for mounted lookouts and gunfights. If they don't, as a consequence, the Bradley can never make quick decisions unless the dismounts are locked away inside the vehicle and unable to provide any assistance at all. So, the Bradley has less mobility across terrain, it needs to be careful when and where to make use of the tow launchers, and the tow missiles are almost useless in woodlands and urban terrain. The dismounts can't help out reliably as lookouts or provide flanking security without the Bradley either being stationary or slowing things down to a walk. And its main gun could potentially be the cause of cancer and other horrible things among the civilian population years after the war is over, depending on what ammunition is used. So yes, the Bradley has some flaws to it, if you ask me. And part of the reason is the doctrine that spawned it, more or less. Uh, the CV-90 was designed based on a doctrine of assault vehicles. The Bradley was designed based on a doctrine using APCs like the M113 to simply taxi soldiers around. Such as during a thunder run, for example, where you pierce deep into enemy held territory at speed, not to be confused with directly assaulting an enemy held position. 
However, I still think the Bradley will play a crucial part in the war in Ukraine as a troop transport, absolutely, and crucially as a tank hunter. Ukraine is famous for its large, vast fields of farmland with wide open spaces and long lines of sight. Perfect conditions for the Bradley's tow launchers. I think the Bradley will be an excellent support platform and a deadly sniper. It can provide overwatch and fire support as tanks and CV-90s advance into combat, covering the assaulting elements' flanks, for instance. And as the assault units establish a foothold, the Bradleys can roll in and unload its troops to help out with cleaning up the enemy. I don't think you want the Bradleys going in with the first wave, it's just not suited for that. The stationary requirements of the tow and the slowed down nature of the dismounted combat does provide some tactical and flexibility issues with the Bradley, as I see it. But it can still be an effective tool in the Ukrainian army, I'm sure of it. I trust that Ukraine will use it to its fullest abilities as a troop transport and as a tank killer. That said, there is a risk, I fear. It will be used in the same manner Ukraine currently uses its troop transports, and I will return to this risk later on. Another vehicle that has been highlighted is the German Martyr I, not to be confused with the Martyr tank destroyer used by Germany in World War II. The Bradley was taken into service in the early 80s and the Martyr IFV in the early 70s, the CV-90 in the mid-90s. The Martyr I is an old vehicle, but followed in the footsteps of the West German Schützenpanzer, a capable troop carrier that has been continuously upgraded over the years equipped with a 20mm autocannon and hatches for the infantry, intended to operate right next to tanks in the heat of battle. While its 20mm gun is quite smaller than the Swedish 40mm, the Martyr I has a Mylan 80 GM, adopted for the vehicle in 1977, not as capable as the tow, which does still provide some good anti-tank capability. The most notable feature is that the crew has to open a hatch to manually handle the ATGM. GM, but I don't see this as a problem, as this is not uncommon for ATGM dedicated vehicles, never mind infantry crews. It makes the Martyr I, despite its age, a vehicle that deserves respect. And in keeping with German tradition, it has the hatches that allows infantry to fight mounted. Not as powerful as the CV-90, it still has its ATGM and the choice of using its infantry mounted or dismounted. Like the Bradley, it can exploit the long fields of fire offered by Ukrainian farmland, and like the CV-90, it can enter dangerous areas and rely on its infantry, tact as lookouts, and for providing security from the hatches, without slowing everything down to walking pace. Originally, it was specifically designed to fight alongside Leopard 1 tanks, of which a large number will also be deployed to Ukraine, but has been upgraded to fight alongside the modern Leopard 2 tanks. So, in terms of tactical flexibility, the Martyr I excels, offering a little bit of both the Bradley and CV-90. And with all the upgrades it has received over the years, it is a capable infantry fighting vehicle in its own right. All three vehicles, CV-90, Bradley and Martyr I, have been tested in combat, be it in Iraq or Afghanistan and all three will definitely be considerable force multipliers for the Ukrainian army. The CV-9040 wants to be aggressive. It was designed to assault enemy positions head-on. A Bradley is more cautious. It wants to fight at range, slow things down. It can't rush into things. That said, the Bradley has engaged Soviet vehicles in two wars against Iraq, where it proved the excellence of the tow ATGMs and the Bradley's ability as a tank hunter in favorable terrain. And the Martyr I can do a bit of everything. It can set up an ambush with its ATGM, and it can push into an enemy position with troops still being useful from the hatches. When deployed to fight, relying on each vehicle's strength, I think we'll see a lot of unhappy Russians in Ukraine. With everything said, all three vehicles can still be used to approach an enemy location that is being hammered by mortars, keeping troops secure inside the vehicle, and then have them dismount anywhere between 0 to 50 meters from the enemy. They can all be used offensively if provided the proper support. If you don't use these vehicles offensively, 
you've reduced them to being very expensive APCs. But each vehicle has its strengths and weaknesses. The CV90 doesn't have ATGMs, the Bradley doesn't have proper hatches, and isn't the best in rough terrain, reducing its flexibility. And the Marder 1 has the smallest gun, and its ATGM is not as capable as the tow on the Bradley. I suppose we should give an honorable mention to the French AMX 10. P as well, since the French will provide Ukraine with a batch of them. More of an APC, if you ask me, a 20mm autocannon, but no anti-tank missiles. <clears throat> well, Saudi Arabia purchased a variant of 10P outfitted with ATGMs, but the French version is no real threat to tanks, in other words. Designed in the 60s and taking its service in 1972, it's a French version of the PBB-302, more or less. What about the vehicles the CV-90 is intended to fight alongside and go up against? We need to be honest and acknowledge that a Russian BMP-2 with a 30mm autocannon is dangerous. Russian ATGMs are dangerous. The CV-90 is not indestructible. But it has a better gun. It has better targeting systems. The CV-90 can engage targets at night and in poor weather. It can outmaneuver the enemy in all types of terrain. So, yes, a BMP-2 or a BMP-3 are real threats with their autocannons and missiles, but the CV-90 is a greater threat to them than the other way around. Russian media has even shared articles where they discuss the need to change tactics for tanks, considering the threat offered by the CV-90 and its 40mm gun. That should tell you how dangerous the CV-90 is to Russian vehicles, especially those with less armor than a main battle tank like the Russian T-72. So what will happen when the CV-90s reach Ukraine? How will they be used? Well, while looking at how Sweden uses the CV-90, I've speculated that Ukraine might copy or adopt some of those tactics. Or they may not. So how does Ukraine use armored vehicles? Well, we have a couple of examples from the war. In our first example, a Ukrainian M113, an American-made APC, nearly gets hit by an RPG. The M113 proceeds to drive along the woods where the Russians fired from. The Ukrainians are hit by an RPG fired from close range. The survivors climb outside and they get hit by another RPG. The few remaining survivors tries to assault the Russian positions. Without going into what they should or could have done, I think this example ties in with my previous point that without lookouts, you will get hit sooner or later. And by the time you dismount, the fight is already over. Lookouts at least gives you the chance to fire first before that RPG is launched. Our second example is a Ukrainian squad assaulting a Russian position with a BMP-1. You have one fire team moving through the tree line and one fire team following behind the BMP-1 as it slowly advances down the field. The fire team behind the BMP-1 fires over the hull of the vehicle using it as cover. Eventually they get so close to the enemy that they start throwing grenades at the Russians. This is dangerous without factoring in enemies shooting at you. If the vehicle hits a mine, the soldiers are obviously casualties. If the vehicle has to quickly reverse out of a situation to avoid getting hit and destroyed, it will run over its own troops. Or it won't be able to avoid getting hit and destroyed because they are afraid of running over their friends. Obviously, with a CV-90, the fire team behind the BMP could have stood in the hatches protected by the armor of the vehicle and fired at the enemy without the risk of getting run over by their own vehicle.
The third example concerns how Ukraine assaults trenches with tanks and infantry. <clears throat> the infantry rides on top of the tank until they reach a position where they can dismount. The infantry then follows the tank on foot in columns behind it, up until they reach a point where they can spread out around it or rush forward to assault the trench line. We've seen this in training videos released by Ukraine, and we've seen it in drone footage from the battlefield. This is not entirely dissimilar from the tactics we saw Sweden rely on during the Cold War, except look at the firepower Sweden brought in to support a few guys on foot, the need for suppression in other words. And also, in this day and age, the risk of getting accurately hit by mortars, drones dropping grenades, machine guns with covering fields of fire, and again, the tank might have to move suddenly to not get destroyed, possibly running over its own troops while going in reverse, or leaving them exposed as it relocates to avoid getting hit. Quite recently, we saw a video of Ukraine assaulting a forest with four M113s. It appears the attack begins with a tank putting down a smoke screen. Where the tank goes next is unclear. The four M113s continues up to the woods and split up in pairs. The lower platoon moves up to the woods and dismounts the troops, and then the vehicles backs away, presumably to provide fire support. The upper platoon makes a strange decision. At quite a distance from the woods, in the middle of the field without any cover, the two M113s stop and dismounts their troops. The soldiers are now left out in the open, without cover, with dozens of meters to cross over open terrain without any protection, vulnerable to mortars, rifles and machine guns. Clearly the proper move would have been to swing down to the other platoon and get away from the open fields if the M113s were afraid of approaching the tree line. And this is the reason for the tactics surrounding using a troop transport to drive all the way up to and into the enemy position. You keep the soldiers safe from machine guns and you quickly cross the territory where the enemy can use indirect fire against you without hitting their own troops. And with hatches you can engage the enemy while being properly protected, moving at speed. Again, the option to fight mounted or dismounted becomes crucial. And I think there is a risk that Ukraine will use the Bradley in the same way as their old vehicles, rolling past enemy locations and allowing themselves to get ambushed by RPGs, following directly behind the Bradley on foot and using it as cover as they cross open ground, simply because the Bradley doesn't offer any options besides the dismounted combat. And there's a risk of them dismounting in the open and walking up to the enemy position, like they do with tanks and the M113s in the last situation. Ukraine often relies on outdated tactics from the Soviet era, despite being trained by Western instructors since 2014. <clears throat> and foreign fighters with experience from Western armies have reported on this as well. Now this must change, and proper equipment and vehicles will make it possible for Ukraine to adopt Western tactics that can defeat the Russian army. And the CV-90 will be instrumental in making this happen and allowing Ukraine to turn this war around, especially if it is used as it was designed to be used, if it is used as it was tailor-made to be used, as modern knights ready to charge into the enemy line and break them, with power and momentum force the enemy to retreat. As one Swedish soldier so delicately described it to a reporter on how the CV-90 is supposed to be used against an enemy. You storm the shit out of them. And if you want the CV-90 to be as effective as it can be, you must make proper use of the dismounts as well. 
according to the YouTube channel Battle Order, an excellent channel by the way, so head on over there and support them, they make excellent content. A Ukrainian mechanized platoon has 21 dismounts, bringing 3 grenade launchers, 4 light machine guns, 1 medium machine gun, and 3 RPGs and 2 marksmen. Compared to the Swedish platoon of 18 troops with 6 grenade launchers, 6 light machine guns, 3 optional medium machine guns, 3 optional marksman rifles, 3 Carl Gustav launchers, 6 to 12 AT4s, plus a number of N laws. The Ukrainian platoon also only has one combat medic, while the Swedish one has one per squad, three in total. If Ukraine provides their CV-90 dismounts with the firepower they need and the options to use the weapons best suited for the specific situation, then the CV-90 and its dismounts will truly come into their own and be able to dominate on the battlefield. A doctrine of aggression, tactical flexibility and maneuverability. That is what the CV-90 and the doctrine surrounding it can provide to Ukraine and it would be a huge mistake for Ukraine to not exploit this advantage. And that will have to be it for now. A bit of a rant about hatches throughout this video, but it's an important feature of the CV-90 of any properly designed IFV if you ask me. So I felt that the history and tactics surrounding hatches on IFVs required a bit of looking into. Having done my conscription in a CV-90 myself, it does have a special place in my heart, so a touch of bias might be evident in this video. But overall, I think I've truthfully presented the positives and negatives of the CV-90, as well as doing an okay job when briefly comparing it to the Bradley and Martyr 1, and other vehicles it may come across in the Ukraine war. So that's it for now, see you in the next one. Gopomarsh, Ukraine!